Once again, we welcome you to today's webinar. This is Preparing Forms for Your NSF AT Proposal. This webinar is brought to you by Mentor Connect. Today's lead presenter is Elaine Kraft. Welcome, Elaine. Thanks, Roxana. Thank you, and hello, everyone. I'm Elaine Kraft, Principal Investigator for the Mentor Connect Project. Thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar is designed to guide you through the preparation of forms associated with submission of an NSF grant proposal. While these forms are not unique to the NSF ATE program, some of the instructions for how you should complete the forms are specific to ATE. Our goal is to help you prepare competitive grant proposals and avoid common mistakes as you prepare and submit your proposal. The Mentor Connect team will provide guidance for completing the required forms, but please be reminded that we are not speaking on behalf of the National Science Foundation. The opinions we express are our own. We will share information from NSF publications as well as from our own experience and, quite frankly, from having made all of the mistakes ourselves before getting it right. Joining me today are my friends and colleagues, Ellen Haas and Charlotte Forrest. Ellen is co-principal investigator for the Mentor Connect project, and Ellen serves as project manager for Mentor and um, Charlotte serves as the project manager for Mentor Connect. As you can see from this slide and the handout we provided, Ellen and I have years of experience completing all of the proposal forms we will be discussing. First, I'd like to give you an overview of what we will be discussing today. Eight specific forms or related documents that accompany NSF ATE proposals. You can see from this diagram that the heart of any proposal is the project description. Some people refer to this as the narrative, and we may use both terms during today's presentation. The project summary is the elevator speech for your project, a short one-page overview of your project. Ellen will share some information about these two project components later in the webinar, but they are not our emphasis today. There are two important forms that we will not be discussing today as well, the budget form and the budget justification documents. These particularly critical components of proposal preparation are covered in a separate webinar that we will provide for you on April 23rd. So what will we be discussing today? The cover sheet, project data form, biographical sketches, current and pending support forms, facilities and other resources form, references cited, data management plan, and the supplemental documents, which are appendices to the proposal. Each item serves a specific purpose. We will walk you through each one and help you understand what is required. Our desire is to help you better understand these forms and how to avoid some of the errors frequently seen by program officers and reviewers. The bottom line is that careful preparation of forms contributes to a proposal that is more competitive overall. I thought an example might help you understand why this whole webinar on forms. Forms are not a trivial part of your grant proposal. The numbers in this example are from an actual project proposal that was submitted to NSF in October 2014. The full proposal was 86 pages long. Of those 86 pages, you can see that the project description or narrative fills 15 pages, which is the maximum allowable length for this component of an ATE proposal. The project summary is restricted to one page. Budget forms consist of a form that you will submit for each year of the project. In addition, a cumulative budget for all years is automatically generated by Fastlane and included. This results in a four-page budget for a three-year project. A little quick math, and you can see that 63 pages, or 73% of the proposal I've used as an example, was made up of forms. Wow, that's a lot of pages of forms. So one piece of advice we have for you today is to get started on these forms right away. Now, I'd like to take just a minute 
and see who's in the audience with us. Um, please use your polling buttons that were described earlier and let us know whether or not you've been a MentorConnect participant, either as a mentor or a faculty team member or other college personnel. Our colleagues at Maytech will tally up the poll and give us the results here. I recognize some of your names on the participant list, and it's great to have so many of our MentorConnect participants in the audience today. We're also very excited to have others of you participating. If you are not already working directly with MentorConnect to learn how to develop good, fundable projects and increase the competitiveness of your NSF ATE proposal, we encourage you to investigate this opportunity. At the end of the webinar, Charlotte will share information about opportunities to learn more and get involved. Now, speaking of Charlotte, I will turn the program over to her to get us started on the actual content about forms. Charlotte? Thank you, Elaine, and thank all of you for your attendance today. Um, the first thing that I would like to introduce to you are two invaluable resources. These resources will uh, be really good for you to refer to over and over again during the proposal and forms preparation process. These two resources include the Advanced Technological Education Program Solicitation and the Grant Proposal Guide, often known by the acronym of GPG. While the Grant Proposal Guide covers everything you need to know to submit a proposal to any division of the National Science Foundation, the ATE solicitation includes information that is critical to ensuring that you meet all of the requirements that are specific to the ATE program. As you will hear from MentorConnect staff and those involved with ATE, read the solicitation. We cannot emphasize that enough. A special note on the ATE solicitation, we recommend that you print and read the solicitation and have it handy while you prepare your proposal. We also suggest that not only the grants office, but all faculty members read this important document. As indicated by the dates, these documents are updated regularly. Typically, the ATE solicitation um, is a three-year solicitation. However, that is not guaranteed, so please keep up to date with this document. Now, as you saw, the third bullet point there was fast lane. And obviously, the proposal submission takes place directly in the fast lane system. There are other systems, um, but today we will emphasize and discuss fast lane. Even before you think about starting on forms in fast lane, please meet as a team and think about some of the following. Decide on one person to handle input into the FastLane system, the principal investigator and sponsored research officer, or SRO, should cross-check and sign off for completeness before submission. Register your institution with FastLane and get your FastLane ID. Know who your sponsored research officer is, and you'll want to do this very early in the process. You do not want to wait. And also, keep in mind that you can hold things or park things in the Fastlane system. It's not final until you hit submit. And as a matter of fact, it's not final until you go through this process of submitting twice. So with all of that being said, please be sure that you're starting on your forms sooner rather than later. Tips and tricks. We just want to quickly draw your attention to the light bulb icon throughout this webinar. These are the tips and tricks from the MentorConnect team, things that we've learned uh, in the hard way, and we would like to draw your attention to these hints that might make your process a little bit easier. So if you see blue, that's going to indicate that, ooh, this is a hot, hot tip. So take advantage. 
Again, read the grant proposal guide. This document is a portion of the what we acronym as PAPPG or the Proposal and Awards Policies and Procedures Guide issued by National Science Foundation. It is fairly easy to identify the location of the grant proposal guide on the NSF.gov website, but we think that one of the easiest ways to find it is via the NSF website by typing GPG into the search box. The website ensures you have the most recent copy. Alternatively, I personally advise that you keep a PDF copy on the USB or on your computer and visit the mentorconnect.org website to access under resources. The grant proposal guide, again, is an important document, but reading the fine print has never been more important. What do I mean by that? Well, seemingly minor information in the fine print can make or break your proposal. One important example includes here as you see on the screen, proposal pagination instructions, proposal margin and spacing requirements, and those page formatting requirements. These are vital in filling out forms for your grant proposal. The quick visual provides you a glance of how the grant proposal guide will look when you access it from the web. Again, in line with your preference, you can also download and view in PDF format. Click on each underlined hyperlink in the web version to find out about a particular topic. In the PDF version, you can search and find various sections of the grant proposal guide main topics. Having the solicitation and this grant proposal guide at your fingertips will save you lots of time and lots of energy while writing your proposal. There are other tools, i.e., the grant preparation checklist that Mentor Connect and Evaluate currently provides to help those participating in the grant writing process navigate the surplus of information. Now, as you see, this slide is titled the Fastlane version. Well, the reason we call this slide the Fastlane version is that's what you see when you begin to put information into Fastlane. However, once you enter the information, it will look a lot different if you see it on a hard copy or a PDF. For the purposes of form completion, we think it will be more helpful for you to see screenshots of exactly where you will be entering your information and also how it looks when it's ready to print. You will be clicking the Go button to complete each form and we'll also go through each form individually. Please note, there are two places, as we've indicated on this slide, uh, for supplemental documents. Also keep in mind, there are a few items that you actually do not need to worry about when navigating this page. There are the, these are the mentoring plan, deviation authorization, suggested reviewers, and additional single copy documents. The mentoring plan is typically applicable only to proposals that include graduate students in the budget. It's not generally something that's applicable at this time to NSF ATE proposals. The additional single copy document, um, this option primarily is used in regard to research at universities when proposal contains proprietary or privileged information. Again, ATE proposals are not likely to need to include this information. Suggested reviewers. This is used in research proposals where the number of experts in the field are limited and very specialized, not applicable to NSF ATE, and this should be left blank. Deviation authorization, any deviation from proposal submission per the grant proposal guide requires advance permission from the appropriate NSF administrator. Lastly, notice that you can save and view the latest date of your save on this page. That's another little note I'd like to highlight. 
Now we'd like to move into the cover sheet, and I'll go through this slide pretty pretty quickly. Um, the cover sheet serves several purposes and has lots of information about the proposal itself. But primarily, the cover sheet is going to provide NSF with a summary that's very short and concise in regard to the administrative data in the proposal. It also certifies that all of the statements in the proposal are true and that you're following appropriate federal guidelines. Um, another important note is that electronic signatures of the PI and institution, when the SRO or the person submitting clicks that, they agree to be required certifications. That is deemed the electronic signature purposes of the proposal. So there are no actual or electronic signature um, signed or inserted here. Here we have a screenshot of what a sample cover sheet uh, might look like in all cases. The majority of ATE proposals, including small grants to those new to ATE, will be in the ATE projects track. Add a choice into the oops, something happened there. I've got a couple of things I want to point out here. The majority of these, um, you'll want to add the choice into the for consideration by NSF, DUE, Division of Undergraduate Education, ATE Projects. And that's here in this box here. Getting your proposal in the right category for review is very important and something that we really want to emphasize. Projects invariably take longer than you think they will, even if you think you can finish your work sooner. It's a good idea to request the maximum time allowed for the type of grant you are requesting. For the small new to ATE category, it's typically going to be a 36-month duration. So under proposed duration, you will likely place 36 months here for a three-year project. You will want to allow time for evaluation upon conclusion of your scheduled project activities. Similarly, the amount requested is an important component in helping make sure your proposal is sent to the appropriate panel review. For example, small grants are typically $200,000 or less, so you will want to be sure to indicate that in the proposal. And it will show up here under requested amount. A note about proposal numbers. This large number at the top is your proposal number and becomes your grant number if your proposal is funded. Knowing your proposal or grant number is very helpful at every stage. This is how you locate your proposal work in Fastlane i.e., if you are participating in a Mentor Connect cohort, we also ask for this number towards the end of the process to track the status of your proposal awards. I'd like to make another note about start dates. NSF is most likely to set your start for the project on the date that you select. Consider what will work for your business office, some like these dates to be aligned with their fiscal year. Consider the time it will take to get faculty release time worked out and when you want to start it. For example, if you receive your award notification in May, you selected a start date of September 1, you have the summer to get these logistics worked out. Choosing a mid-semester start date will make it difficult or impossible to get people working and started um, with the grant, working on the grant and getting support. Don't choose a date that is too early in the calendar year. This could result in receipt of your award notice on or after you've requested the start of your work, which puts you behind from day one. The start date can be changed but not very easily, so keep in mind that what you put into the proposal um, is important. All in all, um, this cover sheet, it isn't a form that is you enter into directly or enter information into directly. You submit the information elsewhere. 
and Fastlane populates this cover sheet that you see on the screen. It populates with information you submit internal to Fastlane in sections that seem a bit varied as you begin working on your proposal. If not done carefully, you can end up, as you see at the bottom of the page, well, and this is, has the information, but what can end up happening is that you end up with PI or co-PI names on the cover sheet that do not have email addresses, phone numbers, or other pertinent information and it would not be printed on the cover sheet. To a reviewer, this can look sloppy, so you want to be sure to check your work. You can always look at the print ready version on Fastlane prior to submission. So this screenshot and this next page here are both documents that are automatically populated that you have the opportunity to view when print, before printing and submitting. So again, please take note of the blue little aqua words here. These are some hot tips from your Mentor Connect team. It is important to remember that the cover sheet is where you will enter the title for your project. Do not use NSF in your title and strive for something that's going to be descriptive, that's going to be meaningful. For example, uh, one of our esteemed colleagues gave us this title, Expanding Internships to Improve Success Rates in Engineering Technology. That's a better approach to selecting a title. Don't try to be cute or demeaning. Um, for example, calling a faculty development project turning bad technician educators into good ones. That may not be a good idea. Names that result in Useful acronyms can be good, but do not create at the expense of clarity on your proposal. Also remember that missing contact information for PI or co-PI sends a message to reviewers that you haven't paid attention to details and that you haven't done a thorough review. Another form that's very vital and important is the project data form. This form provides the reader or reviewer a quick glimpse of the discipline, the type of college submitting the proposal, whether it's two or four years, potential numbers and kinds of populations who will be impacted, and an indication of the kind of proposal this is in the broad terms. For example, the ATE topic area codes are for ATE include K, Project, Program Improvement, Professional Development for Educators, Curriculum and Ed Materials Development, Technical Experiences, Laboratory Development, Research, and Multi-Focus. Those are just some of the codes that you will be able to input down where you see the codes highlighted on this page. Pay attention, close attention, to the section on other institutions involved in the project. This can include organizations, businesses, or partner colleges and high schools that you are working with. If your plan includes working with others outside of your college to achieve your objectives, then this outreach and collaboration will be viewed very positively by reviewers. Be thoughtful about the number of people impacted in the different categories that you that you provide to NSF in this proposal. Give some thought to the numbers you report in this section and keep a record of your calculations as reviewers or your NSF program officer may ask for these details prior to actual funding. Never underreport your anticipated impact as you can see toward the bottom of the page is where you input some of that information. For example, if you are planning to host a workshop to teach 20 high school teachers how to infuse geospatial technology into their classes and expect each of those teachers to use those new modules or geospatial technology tools in at least eight classes over the life of the project, with an average of 25 students per class, 
then you have a good estimate of the number of high school students you will impact. So you want to be sure to report. If you report only the number of teachers you will engage in your workshop, you will be under-reporting the potential impact of your project. So ask yourself this question. If a reviewer divides the amount of money being requested by the number of people you are impacting, will the project look like a good investment? Give some thought to the numbers you report in this section and keep a record of the calculations. Uh, and I want to reemphasize that should you be recommended for funding or move forward in the process, these details may be uh, referred to by a program officer later. Whew. And finally, the table of contents form. This is a bit of a freebie. Fastlane does automate this portion of the proposal, so there is nothing that you have to do here. Now, up until now, we have covered a reasonable amount of preliminary forms information. At this time, we know you're just burning to ask some great questions, so please feel free to do so by entering your questions, as some of you already have, into the chat box. And Mike, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte. How does my audio sound? I just wanted to make sure I'm sounding okay. It sounds great. Thank you. So you gave some interesting information about SROs. And I know that in some colleges, how does a, how does a faculty member know who the SRO is? How, how do you find that out? Do you know that or maybe Elaine knows the answer there? Well, I'll, I think I can take that one, Mike. Um, if you do, and Elaine, please feel free to chime in also. If you do not have an SRO or grants office, the faculty member submitting the grant or some other person at that institution may have authority to speak on behalf of the college as the sponsored research officer. Um, Elaine, if you could add a little bit to that. Um, how, do, if you don't how, do I, yeah. how do I find out who the SRO is? I mean, do I Google it at my institution? What do I do? <laughs> uh, I would look for um, your grants office. Um, it, it may, you know, in community colleges and technical colleges across the country, very often that language SRO or sponsored research office is not as commonly used. Um, because that sort of originated in the in the research um, university world, so they may be called you know grants. Sometimes it's development. Your development office at the college. Uh, the same people that do fundraising uh, in other ways are also over um, fundraising through grants uh, for the college. Um, institutional research offices always work very closely with those individuals. So is if you know who your institutional research person is, they will also know who your grants person is. So those are some suggestions for how to locate um, the person who has this responsibility on your campus. Good. You know, Elaine, um, when Charlotte talked about the SRO, another question came from the audience. Who actually registers the institution with Fastlane and the NSF. Does the SRO do that? Does the faculty? Does the PI? How does that work, Elaine? Um, the person with the SRO um, authority at the college should really do the initial Fastlane registration and get the college set up. Uh, the system is set up with several tiers of permissions, and the person at the top of the tier with the most authority to speak for the college is going to have the most authority. Uh, there will be people in your business office that need authorities in order to do financial transactions with NSF. And um, your SRO will need to have the authority to add and delete people from um, access to the system. Um, so that really needs to start at that level. And then they determine which other people can access the system at what levels, what documents they have access to, and that sort of thing. So it's sort of a, a tiered thing. Uh, and the person at the top has got the greatest responsibility and um, would need to be able to speak on behalf of the college. Okay. That makes sense. 
One last question. I'm sorry to beat up on this, but there's lots of questions about SROs and FastLane. The uh, who registers a faculty, say the principal investigator? How does he or she get registered in FastLane? That's important. And, and what information do they ask for, by the way? There are some. Um, I don't remember all of, uh, all of the details of registration. I've been registered for, for a very long time, as have you, Mike. <laughs> so we've kind of forgotten. Yeah, kind of forgotten um, what they did ask. But usually, it's uh, name. Uh, you probably need a social security number, but from that, they will generate a, a, an ID for you, and you will never use your your social security number for logging in or anything like that. Um, you know, contact information. Um, then NSF will request some demographic information, but they usually make that optional. Um, they are, you know, interested in your your teaching dis um, discipline, uh, whether or not you've got disabilities. Um, you know, just some, uh, you know, race, ethnicity, those kinds of questions. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a demographic profile that you fill out, and um, and then they give you a, a username, um, and you set up. You, you know, you'll usually if your SRO is starting this process for you, you will get um, a temporary ID that gets you into the system, and then you go in and set your own password, and that's when you have an opportunity to provide your personal information. Oh, good. Thanks for that information. Just one more question, and then we'll move on here. And it's a good one. Uh, in our experience, let's say your experience, Elaine, what sort of tech glitches could we anticipate with Fastlane? I, I guess that's sort of a broad question, but I found Fastlane works pretty well without glitches. Uh, is there anything we should worry about or anticipate as we get ready to submit our proposals? Um, Charlotte alluded to this, and I think probably one of the trickiest things is um, that some of the information that is requested is, is really kind of buried. Um, you go into something and you really have to scroll and keep digging deeper and deeper to make sure that you've completed everything you need to complete. Um, sometimes you overlook a whole section. It usually gets caught on the compliance section, but it's um, that's that's one of the things I find. In terms of just day in and day out operation, it really works very well. Um, we'll hear a little bit later from, from Ellen some cautions about using uh, special characters and so forth or when you can cut and paste from Word into Fastlane. And it's not that you have technical problems with Fastlane on that, it's just what prints out um, doesn't always look the way you want it to look. Uh, or it may not count the characters the way you thought and something that needed to fit in a space ends up not fitting in that space. Um, but the best news is they have a fabulous help desk. And if you don't do another thing, to, and it was on one of the early slides, take that help, um, help desk number, the Fastlane help desk, and keep that front and center on your computer. Um, the folks that work that um, help desk are extremely knowledgeable, very helpful, and um, they're, they're readily available all the time. Um, it's a little, it, it, the only time you really have delays is like the day of. Um, a deadline for proposal <laughs> submission, and yes. everybody's panicking and calling. Uh, yes. Response will be a little slower that day, but almost any other time, they are they are really. Uh, your experience has probably been the same, but they're they're phenomenal. They're they're really great. Well, thank you, Elaine. I want to uh, move us forward in the presentation now, but there's some interesting questions that I want you to think about for the next question break, and they have to do with human subjects and the difference between grants.gov and Fastlane. So we'll come back to those two, Elaine. So I'm giving you a little heads up. We're going to ask you those at the, at the next break. Charlotte, I'm going to turn back to you now to take us forward, OK? Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Um, and at this time, I will now uh, pass along, and Ellen Haas will share more information about forms as it relates to the specific proposal components. Thank you, Charlotte, and hello, everyone. I um, wanted to start by talking a little bit about the project summary. Uh, and as you see here on the screen, this is what you will see when you um, um, go into Fastlane in terms of instructions for preparation of the project summary. 
Um, so this is essentially your one pager. It's a summary of the project. It includes an overview, and most importantly, a statement on intellectual merit and a statement on broader impacts. And you're going to have a lot, uh, a lot of emphasis on intellectual merit and broader impacts. So those are terms you're going to be well familiar with by the time you've submitted this proposal. And it's really important to note your proposal will not be accepted if it is submitted without a project summary, or if your project summary does not address both these categories of intellectual merit and broader impact. So here's the actual form itself. You'll see they've provided text boxes to you. Um, and this is, we talked a little bit about technical glitches, and, and Elaine referenced this. Um, you'll be asked to submit um, information in these text boxes. The, the total characters for all three text boxes is 4,600 characters. Um, a lot of folks choose to develop this in Word and then cut and paste into the text boxes. A couple things can happen there. I know personally when I've done it, magically any possessive I've used has turned into a question mark or an equally confusing character. So even though it looks great in Word and you've cut and paste, you do want to go through and proofread what's in there to make sure you haven't had any interesting character conversions. Um, and secondly, sometimes as Elaine referenced, you can have hidden characters that your word count in, in your Word doc may be showing as one thing, but you get an error when you try to cut and paste it into Fastlane because it's showing you as having more characters than are allowed. Um, and ways to troubleshoot that, um, kind of the, the easiest but little time consuming way is to actually just type hand key in uh, that information if you encounter that error. Um, I don't know how common that is, but we did have a Mentor Connect participant last year that that dealt with that and had to actually hand key in these text boxes. So just a little bit on the technical side there. Um, you'll see at the top of this page it's, there's an option that says check here if your project summary is uploaded as a supplementary document. Um, the only reason you would do this is if your project summary includes a lot of um, symbols such as mathematical symbols or Greek letters that a text box wouldn't support. And if that was the case, you would, you would click this and, 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 and load this as a supplement. Um, though I do note that that's not typical to ATE projects. Um, so unless, again, your, your, your summary includes a lot of special characters, you should plan to use and implement, implement your text into these text boxes. Just going to briefly touch a little bit on the content for your project summary. Um, so again, it's broken into three parts. Your overview is a description of the activity that would result if your proposal were funded, and a statement on the objectives and methods that you're going to use. And what is key here is uh, very clearly in the first few sentences, you want to indicate your disciplinary focus the kinds of activities you're proposing, whether it's focused on curriculum development or professional development, and then your primary audience for those activities. And this is really important because NSF uses this information to assign your proposal to a panel for review. So you want to make sure you're, you're going in where you want to be reviewed. Um, and again, the summary is a place to get right to the point of your grant. Um, you don't want to use this space for building a rationale for your project or describing your college or your community environment or state the amount of money you're requesting. Um, this is a place to do a really concise overview. As we say here on the slide, you want to think about it as your elevator speech. Um, so if this is all someone reads about your project, they should be able to understand what you're trying to do and your desired outcomes. And I just want to talk a little bit about the, this intellectual merit and broader impact piece. And we're going to refer you time and time again to the, the request for proposals and for the, to the grant proposal guide um, because they specifically address intellectual merit and broader impacts and outline some of the criteria that you'll need to address in your proposal and that your reviewers will be, will be looking for as they, as they review your proposal. So your statement on intellectual merit should describe the potential of the pro proposed activities to advance knowledge. And your broader impact statement should describe the proposed activity's ability to benefit society. So those are rather broad. <laughs> the ATE proposal solicitation um, actually breaks down um, that criteria for you in a specific session, uh, section on merit review principles and criteria. So you'll want to pay close attention to that. Um, and just to give you some brief examples, under intellectual merit, uh, you may want to address the question, does the project have the potential for improving student learning in science or engineering technician education programs? Are the goals, objectives, and outcomes for achieving them worthwhile, well-developed, and realistic? This is what the reviewers are going to be looking for um, when they're reading your, your statements. Broader impacts as an assessment of workforce needs for technicians been conducted. Does the project work with employers to address their current and future needs for technicians? Will the project's results be widely disseminated? And will its products be distributed effectively and or commercialized when appropriate? 
So again, just be sure to pay close attention to these when crafting your statements on intellectual merit and broader impact. Um, and now I just want to cover the project description. Um, as Elaine said, this is not the, the focus of, of this webinar. We're talking about the, the, the project description as a form, but the form here is really uploading a 15-page document. So we want to give you a little bit on those components. As Elaine mentioned, this is the heart of your proposal, and this is where you're providing that clear statement of work and the activities that you would undertake if you're funded. So in essence, it should address what, what you want to do, why you want to do it, how you plan to do it, and how you'll know if you're successful, and what benefits and impacts will result from a successful project. So in essence, that means you're including information on all of these things on this slide. Your, your motivating rationale, goals, objectives, deliverables, timetable management plan, roles and responsibilities of PIs, co-PIs, and other senior personnel, sustainability plan, evaluation plan, dissemination plan, and broader impacts of the proposed work. And I'll talk about that in a second. All in the uh, glorious 15 pages limit that you're given. Um, so it, it sounds um, daunting, but it's, it's, it's doable, very doable. Um, so again, um, when looking at your project description, you're going to want to you know, pay attention to including all of these components within a set time uh, page limit. And pay attention, as I've mentioned, to addressing intellectual merit and broader impacts. And new in this new grant proposal guide that came out, um, you actually need to include in your project description a section entitled Pro Broader Impacts of the Proposed Work. And that's where you can talk about this broader impacts piece. Um, some examples of things you might want to include there, outcomes that would relate to um, reaching women and underrepresented minorities in STEM, improving STEM education at a particular level, or increasing partnerships with business and industry, just as some examples of, of potential broader impacts. And then in terms of the form itself, as I mentioned, it would be uploading the file in, into, directly into FastLane. You can upload your project description as a PDF or actually a variety of word processor files, and FastLane will convert it to PDF for you. And this is another place where you want to obviously check that conversion and make sure um, everything is converted properly and it looks on the screen how you intend it to look. Um, and if there's an issue with that, say you were converting it from Word, you may want to convert it to PDF yourself so you know exactly how it's going to look. Um, when, it, when it goes into FastLane. Um, some of these, a few other tips for preparing your project description. Charlotte referenced some of these. They may seem like no-brainers, but they really bear um, mentioning and reminding you about because they're very crucial to the success of your proposal. Do pay attention to font size and layout and the size of your document. As we mentioned, this project description, all that information must fit into 15 pages with one-inch margins on all sides. Um, you also need to um, look at font. The grant proposal guide allows for a minimum font of 10 point in specific fonts such as Arial and Courier. For Times New Roman, they require an 11 point font. Uh, we recommend you, you, you use an 11 or a 12 point standard font to really ensure readability. You'll want to use section headings, bullets, or charts to ensure a clear proposal and readability. And again, any visuals you use within your project description needs to be included in that 15 pages. And do keep in mind your reviewers when you look at how this reads and how this is laid out. Um, you have reviewers that could be reading you know, anywhere from 10 to 12 proposals. And yours is the last one they got to at 11 o'clock at night. And um, if it's not laid out well, if it's got a small font, um, or you know, it's not following some of the um, guidelines um, that have been provided, it's not going to encourage a good rating. So you just want to be aware of how it looks as well as the content that, that you've put in there. Um, on another point of formatting, you do not want to use automated endnotes. You actually can number your references in your project description and then list them in a separate reference section. And Elaine's going to talk about that um, a little later. Um, as another note, your project description should be self-contained. So you don't want to include a URL or reference a URL and expect a reviewer to go out and click that for more information. Um, first of all, that they're not required to do that. They're under no obligation to, to go off your page, um, what you put, what you link someone to could exceed your page limits and, and uh, you know, a website could be altered or down if somebody did that. So it's not a good idea. You want your project description to be self-contained. Um, and then as, I, as we've mentioned all along, you know, again, look at your grant guidelines. I mentioned the broader impacts heading and that's a required section within your project description. 
Another required section is results from prior NSF support. If that is applicable to you, you actually have to start your project description with results from, from prior support. Um, as the majority of you are new to NSF funding, this, this again wouldn't be applicable to you. But if any co-PI or PI identified on the project has received NSF funding in the past five years, you need to include information on that, reward, on that award that's required. And, you know, and funding would include not just salary support, but any funding award by NSF. So just some things to think about when putting together your project description. And now I'd like to move to um, the biographical sketches or the bio sketches. Uh, you're required to submit a bio sketch for each individual on a proposal identified as senior personnel, including PIs and co-PIs. And NSF uh, requires very specific format for the bio sketches. Uh, they're not to exceed two pages. Um, if you want to you know, take a look at that formatting, it's in the grant proposal guide. And it's a really good idea to create a template for these to, to circulate to your senior personnel so they know exactly what type of information to put in in the required format. And then Connect has some examples of bio sketches in its, in its resources for you to reference as well. Um, so the bio sketches can be uploaded for each individual senior personnel or as one document with all bio sketches included. And this is one of those things you know we say start early, but this is something you can work on now. You, you're going to want to complete these as soon as possible and get them uploaded into FastLine so you don't have to worry about some of these, these forms when you're, you know, you'd really want to be um, investing your time in the, in the heart and the meat of your proposal. I just want to kind of briefly cover the components of this. Again, this is you know, very detailed in the grant proposal guide. Um, but quickly, the bio sketches, um, you don't want to include any personal contact information on those. And you're going to want to include the following components. Professional preparation, where you're going to list the name of the undergraduate, graduate, or postdoctoral institution that the individual attended, include its location, and the individual's major degree in the year the degree was conferred. Under appointments, in reverse chronological order, you're going to list all of the individual's academic and professional appointments beginning with most current employment. Products, or this could be publications. This is a list of five products that most closely relate to the proposed projects that are citable that you could include a full citation. Um, things such as publications or data sets or software. Keep in mind that um, the bio sketches, this format is for anyone submitting to NSF. So it's also been developed to meet the needs of the research community. So some of these sections may not be applicable to you as new ATE PIs, ATE PIs and that's okay. Um, but we're, we're letting you know um, what, what the format is. And if you have a publication that you can put there, that's wonderful. If not, that's, that's, that's certainly okay. But this is the required format. Synergistic activities, again, a list of up to five activities that relate to the proposal or reflect the demonstrated skills or assets or inroads into program activities. Some examples of those um, could be you've been a subrecipient of an ATE Center grant, or you're working with ATE projects as primary partners, you served in an advisory role, or you are a member or you participate in a professional society that relates to the work to your proposed work, such as the Council on Undergraduate Research or the American Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges. So just as some examples of things that can be put into that category. And collaborators and other affiliators or other affiliations, this actually has three sections, um, some of which may not apply to you. Um, but this is essentially you would list all persons in alphabetical order, including their organizational affiliations who are currently or have been collaborating with with the individual on a, on a project, an article, a book, or a paper that relates to the scope of work during the 48 months prior to submitting this proposal. Or if you have uh, co-edited a, a journal or conference proceedings um, with someone, then it would be including that individual within the last 24 months. And then if applicable, this, um, this section also asks that you include information on graduate advisors and or thesis advisors. Again, that's more in the the, the research community or other um, avenues of NSF, but if, if you, you know, have your PhD and want to list your graduate advisor, your thesis advisors, this is a, a place that that would be included. And now I would like to turn it over to Elaine to talk about um, a wonderful form, the Current and Pending Support Form. Thanks, Ellen. The Current and Pending Support Forms are required. Many people find these forms confusing. To understand how to correctly complete the forms, it helps to know why you are being asked to do so. This is the reason. 
NSF wants to know that the individuals who will be working on the grant will not be committed for more than 100% of their time should the proposal be funded. Also, NSF wants personnel working on grants to have dedicated time to do this work. The expectation is that grant personnel will have a portion of their normal workday or work week dedicated to the work of the grant, and that the cost of providing this time will be covered with grant funds. Alternately, or additionally, a person may be paid with grant funds for doing grant work when not under contract to the institution, which is frequently the case during summer months. We will talk more about this issue during the April MentorConnect webinar on developing a budget and budget justification for your NSF APE proposal. For now, just keep in mind as you complete your current and pending support forms that NSF will not allow a person to be more than 100% committed if he or she serves in a PI, co-PI, or senior personnel role for a funded project. That means that all of the person's work time cannot add up to more than 100% of a standard workday or work week for the person's job with the organization. And they may not be paid more than 100% of a normal full-time salary. This means that faculty release time must be within their normal workload, and also means no overload pay for faculty who may be accustomed to receiving extra compensation to teach extra courses. In general, there can be no extra pay for doing grant work in addition to the person's regular workload. There are very limited exceptions to this, but tread carefully, and we advise discussing what you have in mind with the program officer at NSF in advance of proposal submission. Now let's talk about how many of these forms you will need to prepare. Separate entries are needed and required for each person serving in a senior personnel position, which includes the principal investigator, all co-principal investigators, and anyone else working on the project that you classify as senior personnel. And for each person, there must be a current and pending support form for each proposed or ongoing project for which the person has a time commitment, including the proposal you are preparing. This means that every person included in your proposal in one of these categories will have at least one current and pending support form, even if this is your first NSF ATE proposal. The grant proposal guide tells us that current and pending support forms must include all current project support from whatever source. So if a person who will be working on your project is receiving financial support from other grant funding sources, this support and the corresponding time commitment must be listed. The GPG cites, as examples, federal, state, local, or foreign government agencies, public or private foundations, industrial, or other commercial organizations. Please note that the grant proposal guide also states that the proposed project and all other projects or activities requiring a portion of the PI time or other senior personnel time must be included even if they receive no salary support from the project. As you can see, the time commitments for all senior personnel who will be working on a project can't be taken lightly or taken for granted. If this is your first grant, you may have only one current and pending support form for each person serving on, in these roles. However, check to make sure that these individuals are not working on other funded projects such as Department of Labor, state funded grants, or foundation funded grants that will need to be reported. Now, let's talk about the information that you will need to supply on the current and pending support forms. There is a template in Fastlane for preparing current and pending support forms. This is what the template looks like in Fastlane. The process goes more quickly if you collect all of the information you will need prior to completing the form. I will walk you through each line for which you will be supplying information. Also, check and double check to make sure that the information you submit in the current and pending support form is consistent with information that you provide elsewhere in the proposal. The budget, for example, is one place where you will talk about the time commitment of personnel. NSF staff will check to make sure that the time commitment is consistent and done correctly.
You will need to supply the following information for each project and person for whom a form is completed. The project or proposal title. The source of support. This is asking who funded the project or who is being asked to fund a proposal. Typical sources include the National Science Foundation, Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Education, a state such as California, or a foundation such as the Lumina Foundation. It asks for the project location. This is typically uh, where you list your institution or the location of the entity currently implementing a previously funded award for which you know, you've got time commitment. The total award amount, uh, this is where you report the total budget being requested or the amount that has already been awarded um, for a project that's being reported. A start date and ending dates are pretty self-explanatory. The support type, this is where you're going to choose either current or pending. Um, if you're working on a proposal that you're going to submit, that's going to be a pending. Um, anything that's already funded, um, that's current. Um, so uh, that's a pretty easy decision to make. Now, we'll get to the last thing down here, and this is where most of the errors get made. The person months per year committed to the project. I've put a little example on the slide here for you as I kind of talk you through this. The person months per year committed to the project is a way that you report a person's time commitment to each of the projects that you're reporting on that is taking up a person's time. As you will see in the bubble note on this page, this question is not whether or not you will be working on a project all year, but rather how much time you will devote to the project over the course of a year. That will not be 12 months unless you are full time on the project. Person months must be reported with only one decimal place, so you may need to round off numbers when reporting. There are three options organized into two categories for reporting time as person months. The person months to be reported in one category or the other, not both. And I've divided those with this red line across the middle there. The first category is calendar. This category is typically used for 12-month personnel who will work some in every month during the year. Person months reported in this category are most often associated with salaried personnel who work a percentage of time such as 10%, 50%, 75% throughout a 12-month calendar year. The second category includes academic and summer. This category is most often used for faculty. Faculty typically work on academic year contracts. Some faculty who work during the summer on a summer contract. The academic and summer boxes are provided to report this time in person months. To determine person months for faculty requires some calculation, unless the person is being supported 100% by the grant. Since this reporting of person months on current and pending support forms and on budgets is often done incorrectly, let's dig a little deeper and go through a couple of examples. In the first example on the screen, we have a 12-month employee who dedicates 10% of his or her time to grant work. The number you should put in the current and pending support form is 1.2 calendar months, which is 10% of 12 months. Note that you report time in months using only one decimal place. If you have made an entry in the calendar box, leave the other two boxes blank. Let me repeat that. If you make an entry in the calendar box for an individual for a project, the other two, the academic and summer boxes, should be empty. Next, consider a faculty member who is working on an academic contract. Typically, these contracts are for nine months, but in some situations, it may be a 10-month contract. This is where your math skills will be needed because all time must be listed in months. Some translation will be required. For example, if a faculty member typically teaches five courses per semester, and this person will be provided with one course release time to work on the grant both fall and spring semesters, that is considered one-fifth of the person's workload or 20% release time. 
calculate 20% of the months color covered by the academic year contract and report that in the academic time slot on the form. In this example, I assumed a nine-month contract, a full-time teaching load of five classes, and one course release time per semester to be provided by the grant. This will be 1.8 person months for the academic year. If the release time for this person is just for one semester and not two semesters, then you would report half as much time in months based on the number of months covered by the person's academic calendar contract. One course release time for one semester would be 0.9 person months in this case. Now, let's consider a situation where the teacher who had the one course release time for fall and spring will also work on the grant in the summer. Again, you must determine the time the person will work on the grant in terms of the months and report this in the summer box option. For example, the summertime commitment could be two weeks or half a month, which would be reported as 0.5 person months. If a faculty member works on the project only in the summer, then you put person months in the summer box and leave the academic box empty. So you can put numbers in the academic box and the summer box, one or the other or both. But if you put things in those boxes, leave the calendar box empty. If you put something in the calendar box, leave the academic and summer boxes empty. I will stress one more time that if you have used calendar months in reporting project time for an individual, under no circumstances should you also report academic or summertime for the same person for the same project. Now, once you complete all of your current and pending support forms, then FastLane produces a form that looks like this example. In this case, it was the PI's first grant, and there is only one entry on the form. For an individual working on multiple projects, the form may have several entries. Again, NSF will be looking to see what the total time commitment is for an individual across all projects. One of the most frequent errors seen on current and pending support forms is mixing calendar year months with academic and or summer months. Don't do it. Although it states in some NSF documents that faculty time is limited to two months, this is not true for ATE grants. This is one important distinction for this funding program. An important point about personnel time on grants is that it needs to be reasonable and aligned with the work that the person will be doing. Reviewers expect to see key personnel included in the budget with compensation for time they devote to grant work. Beware of having personnel donate time to grant funded projects. For one thing, reviewers will really not believe that the scope of work will be completed without some grant supported personnel named who have specific responsibilities for the scope of work and are being compensated to do it. Reviewers will be looking for faculty time and budget to support that time. Also, donated time may be considered voluntary committed cost sharing, which is prohibited. We'll talk more about this issue in next month's budget webinar. Now, let's move on to facilities, equipment, and other resources form. This form provides an opportunity to explain the infrastructure, laboratories, and equipment at your institution, and perhaps at partner locations that will be available for use to support the success of a project. You may also mention personnel as part of the other resources. With this form, you should focus on equipment, infrastructure, and personnel that will or might be important to your project. It isn't necessary to describe all the capabilities of the college. It can be distracting to reviewers if the descriptions do not seem to have bearing on the project that is being proposed. NSF instructions state that in order for NSF and its reviewers to access, to assess rather, the scope of a proposed project, all organizational resources necessary for and available to a project must be described in the facilities, equipment, and other resources section of the proposal. The NSF grant proposal guide states, the proposer should include an aggregate description of the internal and external resources, both physical and personnel, that the organization and its collaborators will provide to the project should it be funded. Such information must be provided in this section in lieu of other parts of the proposal, such as your budget justification or project description. 
The description should be narrative in nature and must not include any quantifiable financial information. Again, this gets at this um, prohibited voluntary cost sharing issue. Note that the instructions specifically tell you to not assign monetary value to items listed and described on this form. If you have personnel who will devote time to the project but will not be included in the budget, this is a good place to include this information. Now to the form itself. The form offers the following categories for submitting information. Laboratory, clinical, animal, computer, office, other, and major equipment. For ATE grants, the clinical and animal categories are typically not applicable. And you may indicate this on the form uh, as has been done in this example on the screen. Uh, as Mike pointed out earlier, um, these forms are designed for all of NSF and serve um, the research directorate. So um, that's why there are you know, a few things on each form that really are not applicable to ATE. Uh, in the laboratory uh, support area, um, that is very often important for an ATE grant. And if this is the case for your project, then you'll want to describe your current capability, even if the proposal includes some improvements or equipment additions. Computer capability can also be essential for your grant, especially if the project focuses on information technology, cybersecurity, or any number of other advanced technologies um, that are computer dependent and will make use of the computing capability in computer labs at your institution. Office support. This is also important to describe since the budget guidelines specifically state that grant budgets may not include office furnishings or everyday office equipment such as computers, copiers, and items that support normal office operations. The personnel implementing the grant, however, will definitely need these things. They'll need the office support to do so. So if your institution is providing dedicated office space, access to administrative support or similar, this is a good place to make a statement about this support. In the other category, it's where you can describe resources other than facilities and equipment, plus a, you know, such as the personnel support we mentioned. For example, this is a place where um, if you've got internal talent that you've assembled to serve in internal advisory committee, or perhaps you have a college recruiter lined up who will support the outreach activities of the grant, but will not receive compensation from the grant for doing so. You may have a marketing department who's agreed to help you design brochures for your program. Any of these um, personnel who will be helping could be described in this area. But again, remember don't put any monetary value um, associated with this. In the major equipment category, can be very important in some ATE grants. Advanced technology programs are very often equipment intensive. Your institution may have major equipment that will be used in implementing the grant, or you may have a partner university or industry working with the project and providing major equipment for your students to use. Perhaps you have a university or industry partner with an electron microscope or a clean room that will be used for teaching your students. If major equipment is involved in the success of your project, this is the place where you can describe these resources. I think you can see that the facilities, equipment, and other resources form gives you an opportunity to share information that you can't fully describe elsewhere in your proposal. The final set of ancillary materials for your pro proposal, known as supplementary documents, is the other place where you can include additional information to support your proposal. Now let's take a look at the references cited. Um, Ellen mentioned this a little bit earlier. NSF expects you to do some research in the process of developing a grant proposal. Like most funding sources, they encourage the use of research-based strategies and adaptation and implementation from previously funded NSF ATE or other funded projects. Your references indicate that you have investigated what others have done that worked. You will want to cite references that explain outcomes that led you to select a particular strategy, curriculum, teaching methodology, or other promising or proven approach to address your challenges in technician education. Reference citations are also essential for the data you provide in building your rationale. Uh, so if you use the Department of Labor publication to get uh, employment data, for instance, you will want to cite that in your references. As you include information from your research, um, here is one tip to keep in mind. You will want to manually enter your references throughout the project description 
and prepare a separate document with citations that correspond to those numbers. You don't need to put a lot about your, your citation in the, the body of your proposal. Um, they tend to take up a lot of space and you may not, not need to do that. You can just uh, do a short reference to it, put a number by it, and then list it in your references list. The references are actually a separate document and thus are uploaded separately in the fast lane. References do not count towards your 15-page project description. You recall that I suggested that you manually number and refer your references as you work. Ellen mentioned this as well. If you use automated EndNotes, your citations will be included within your 15-page project description, and that is not where they belong. You will have to do the separate references cited section in the proposal, and that will be duplicate information as well. Now, let's talk a minute about the data management plan. Including a data management plan is a fairly recent requirement for ATE proposals. The, the requirement has been um, there for other um, NSF funding programs for quite some time. The requirement now is that proposals must include a supplementary document of no more than two pages labeled data management plan. This supplement should describe how the proposal will conform to NSF policy on the dissemination and sharing of research results. In essence, NSF explain, expects you to share the outcomes of your work and timely publication of results is encouraged. However, there are considerations of privacy, confidentiality, intellectual property, and other rights. The data management plan provides an opportunity for you to describe the care that will be taken in this regard. NSF documents state that your data management should describe the types of data, samples, physical collections, software, curriculum materials, and other materials to be produced in the course of the project. So tell them what it is you're going to be generating. Then it says you need to include the standards to be used for data and metadata format and content. How are you going to maintain this information? What formats are they going to be in? And how are you going to protect them? The next qualification or, or requirement is that policies for access and sharing include provisions for appropriate protection of privacy, confidentiality, security, intellectual property, and other rights or requirements. So you really need to have a plan in advance for how you're going to protect this information. They want you to share it, but they want you to share it responsibly um, and not share things you shouldn't share. So pay close attention to how you're going to do that and give it some thought in advance and include this in your data management plan. Um, it also asks that you include policies and provisions for reuse, redistribution, and production of derivatives. Again, this, this particular uh, element may apply more to some of the research directorates than it does in ATE. The last item is plans for archiving data, samples, and other research products and for the preservation of access to them. Um, the new solicitation for ATE actually requires that at the end of a project that um, products and information from a project be archived with ATE Central, uh, also funded by NSF ATE. Um, and this uh, can be part of your plan for how you're going to archive this and how it's going to be remain um, accessible to people after your grant has ended. You may have a website that's going to be maintained after the grant is over, that sort of thing. So just give some thought to this and, um, and read the, the guidelines um, in the GPG about the data management plan. And on the ATE Central site, they actually have a little, um, a little guide to how to develop one of these um, data management plans for your um, proposal. So now let's move on and um, I'll let Ellen talk to you about the supplementary documents we've referred to a couple of times. Thanks, Celine. I'm going to go over this quickly so we have some time to address uh, the really good questions that I see popping up in the chat box. Um, the only required supplemental documents, um, you know, Charlotte alluded to this in the table of contents in, in the overview, um, and then Elaine just mentioned, is are the data management plan. We just talked about that. And then this listing that you see here, you need to include a document listing all the people receiving compensation from your project and their affiliation. This is required. Um, and this is all the people receiving um, compensation aside from participants or students. So this is something you're going to need to create. There's a sample here, and you need to upload this as a supplementary document. So just you know that is a requirement. 
Um, while not required, though certainly encouraged, are letters of commitment. And again, I want to stress that the word here is commitment, not letters of support. Um, you want to see documentation. Uh, reviewers want to see documentation of commitment that um, outlines specific collaborations or partnerships or resources pledged to the project, and not merely be a letter that say, I support it, way to go, um, but actual letters such as something from an industry partner pledging resources or their time to the project should it be awarded. And you also want to be aware, uh, be aware of boilerplate. Um, you know, it's, it's, it always seems like a really great idea to send out some um, paragraphs to all your, your folks to use, but they will include them in, their, in your letters. And you, what you, don't, you want to avoid is five identical letters or five letters where the, the three paragraphs in the middle are exactly the same, because um, it really does call into question the level of commitment on behalf of that partner. Um, examples of other supplementary documents that you can include, again, though not required. Um, say you're proposing to revamp curriculum and you've already updated one module, you might want to include a sample of that module. Or if you're conducting a professional development uh, workshop uh, as part of your activities and you have a draft agenda for that workshop, you could include that um, as, a, as a supplementary material. You do want to be careful not to go over 30 pages in, in, your, in your supplements. Uh, reviewers are not required to read over that amount and it's discouraged. Um, and just a note that any supplemental documents that you upload are going to need to adhere to the same font and page for formatting requirements um, as the project description. So anything that you, you upload on the back end has to follow the same um, uh, font and um, page formatting requirements. Um, with that, I'm actually just going to go to you know, these generally good ideas, which we've said. You know, start early, review what you've written, put it in Fastlane, take it out of Fastlane, but do start on some of these forms as you can get some of these things out of the way so you're not in such a, a time crunch come fall. And don't be afraid to ask questions. And I'm going to actually go now to our final question um, break, if you will, um, to allow you to do just that. So if you want to enter any questions that you have into the chat box, if you haven't already, we'll take those at this time. And I'll turn it over to Mike to field those. Thank you, Ellen. You know, our heads are sort of swimming over these time commitment things, but it's an important issue, isn't it? Let me turn this question to Elaine. Elaine, this is an important one because I remember as a faculty when I was writing a first grant, I was thinking, oh boy, I can get some extra money for my effort here. Uh, so here's the question that came in, and I think it's a good one. Uh, can we clarify, faculty cannot work overload at all during grant participation period, or is it just grant-related compensation that can't be paid? Um, it's a common question, isn't it, Elaine? Yes, Mike. Unfortunately, it is. And um, they can't be paid. Uh, the, the general answer is they can't be paid an overload at all. It doesn't matter whether it's the grant money paying for it or the college paying for it or he's paying for it. Um, NSF does not want that faculty member more than 100% loaded while they're working on the grant and getting any grant compensation. Um, there are a couple of, of exceptions I mentioned. If, if, um, you know, if you want to pursue one of these paths, you might want to run it by a program officer before you do so. Let's say you have a, a workshop that you're planning in your grant, and it's, you've got two Saturdays um, that this workshop is going to be conducted on two Saturdays. And this faculty member doesn't typically work on Saturdays for the college. It's outside their normal contract and scope of work. Um, NSF will allow payment for those two sort of isolated events. You can pay the faculty extra to do that, um, but not during the time frame of, of their normal work. Um, in the summer, there is some flexibility um, for, uh, for payments a little different than in the academic year. The academic year seems to be the, the, the place where NSF is strictest about this, most strict about this. Um, so you just have to be really careful. But it is a really, really tough issue in the ATE program. And uh, we have complained because um, overloads are sort of a uh, very much the culture of two-year colleges. We have lots and lots of faculty that teach overloads all the time. And when they learn they have to give that up in order to do this grant work, um, that, that creates um, some real uh, struggles sometimes. 
But we hope that the rewards of doing this fabulous work <laughs> and working with the National Science Foundation is worth this for a short term. Um, and I think if you, you know, if you arrange your schedule and, and can get um, perhaps some extra, um, you know, pay in the summer, or like I said, for some maybe isolated activities, but just day in and day out, you really can't go over the hundred percent. Is my understanding. I think you're certainly right about that. You know, here where we are at the Maricopa Community Colleges, the faculty tend to be on a nine-month contract, so that does free up some time in the summer uh, to take advantage, just as, as you've just said. You know what, before we go into our, the rest of our final questions, I'm going to ask Roxana to launch our survey. Folks, I'd like you to help us pay the bill, right, where we need to report to the National Science Foundation that people that have attended this webinar find value in it. So the survey that you'll see on your screen asks you a couple of quick questions, and then you hit the Submit button at the end. So we're going to leave this survey up for everyone, and I'd like everyone to take it, please. Come back from checking your email and take the survey. That was a joke. And, uh, and moderators, please don't hit Submit on this survey. So let's go to the next question. Ellen, I'm going to turn to you. It's about the project description. First question. Now, there's that project summary. Do I get to choose to put it before or after the project description, or is that some sort of automated thing? Uh, the, the project summary is actually a separate section of the proposal, and it will always precede the project description or the project narrative. So Fastlane is going to automatically order those components once the content is uploaded. Um, but in terms of something to think about, you might want to do create as you're developing your proposal, your project description first, and then work on your project summary so it really has that, that clarity of message. Um, and it's really that project overview. So it might be something you want to do last, but when you upload it, it will always come prior to the project description. Oh, that's a good point. You know, another person online asked if you can use color in your project description, you know, like to illustrate tables or to bring out graphs. Can you use color? Yes, you can use color in your project description. Okay. I'd like to chime in on that um, and just um, caution people that if you do use color, make sure that you print it out in black and white and see how it translates. Um, if your reviewers happen to be reviewing your proposal online, they will be looking at the PDF version. They will see the color. Mm -hmm. if, they ask, if they ask that NSF print those um, proposals for them and send them to them to review, which many, many, many um, reviewers do, um, NSF only prints in black and white. And if you use color sometimes, you can absolutely make something so that it cannot be read. Um, you know, by, by using the color. It looks great in color, but it doesn't translate well to a black and white copy. So be sh you know, it's okay to use color, but be sure you see what the black and white version of it looks like before you submit. That's a good suggestion. Thanks. Now, Ellen, I have another one for you. You talked about the bio sketches, and I think there was like five areas that you had to focus. I guess I can't add my hiking and sailing hobbies on the end there, huh? That was a joke. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no uh, yes, you should actually, you know, it's really looking for your, your educational background, your, your, um, your preparation, and any, you know, as, you know, as it points out, synergistic activities that relate to the proposed scope of work. So um, I'm not sure that the hiking or the, or the sailing or those things would apply. <laughs> darn, darn. But certainly well, your professional associations um, uh, in relation to STEM would. Well, I know many of us, you know, we have our resumes right, and it does have personal stuff on it sometimes. Well, so that was a good point. I appreciated that. Uh, folks, I want to remind you there's the survey is just coming up now for about another 30 seconds, just enough time for Ellen, oh no, excuse me, Elaine. We're going to ask Elaine this one. Uh, once she finishes this, this answer, we're going to close the survey and then go into our final important announcements. Elaine. Now let's think about current and pending support. What if I have money from a private foundation or maybe even an industry contract? So these are non-federal things. Does it go on to that current and pending form? According to the GPG, yes. It does. Um, again, again, NSF is really looking for um, you know, how much of your time is being taken up by all the various things that you're doing. You know, they don't want to get shortchanged. <laughs> sure. They, they want a piece of you if they're going to give you their grant money. Sure, that makes sense. 
All right, folks, uh, let's get ready. We're going to do a brief countdown on closing the survey. Roxana, let's close it in five seconds. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for participating. Five, four, three, two, one. And that will close the survey. One more question, and then we'll go into Charlotte's uh, announcements. You know, you mentioned, Alan, I think it was you that was at the end of your presentation saying, you know, if you need help with these things, you can uh, contact Mentor Connect. Would you ever call an NSF program officer also to ask them for help, or maybe your sponsored research officer? Where would you turn first for these questions? I mean, how broad do we want to ask here? That's my question. Let's go to uh, Ellen first for that. Uh, I, you, you certainly can can pose a question to an NSF program officer. Um, you know, we have the, the Mentor Connect Health help desk. So we would say this is a, a place that you could start. You could certainly consult your SRO on your campus. But um, NSF program officers are also um, happy to, to help and address um, questions you know, particularly related to what you know to, to content, some ideas that you're focusing on. I would say if it's more to do with some of the mechanics, Mentor Connect might be your best bet as, as um, so we structured this program to try to help fill that role for NSF who can get completely inundated with requests. <laughs> I don't know if Elaine or Charlotte wants to add on to that. Elaine, do you have anything to add there? The NSF program officers are uh, the most user friendly of any mm -hmm. uh, grants officers on the face of the earth that I know of. They're wonderful. However, they are extremely busy. Um, the only challenge is, is getting in touch with them. But um, they they are very responsive and they will get back to you if you can get in touch with them. Uh, the Mentor Connect project is funded by NSFATE because um, it helps uh, spread their reach, if you will, um, and you can get answers pretty quickly uh, through our project. Um, the sponsored research office or grants office at your institution uh, can be very helpful about some things. Um, they may work in other programs a great deal more than they work in. Um, NSF, and so may not you know be as up on some of the specifics of the NSF program, um, but they are, they are certainly a great resource for you. Good, thank you. You know, if everyone will look at their atomic clocks on their computers, you'll see that we're perfectly on time here, and we're now going to turn to Charlotte. I'm going to invite those of us who would like to stay for an extra two minutes at the very end. We'll, we'll have a couple of questions about this summertime and 100% time for those of you that want to stay. But Charlotte, why don't you take us through our last set of announcements as we're now at the near the end of the webinar? Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Um, I just want to point out a couple of things very quickly. We must mention our upcoming uh, another upcoming webinar opportunity. Our webinar entitled Preparing a Budget and Budget Justification for Your NSF ATE Proposal will be hosted live by the Mentor Connect team on Thursday, April 23rd. It will be this same time at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we will definitely, during this webinar, take a deep dive into how to formulate vital components of this vital component of the proposal. So it will be specifically going almost line by line, helping um, those of you who are putting in proposals to put in an, a really great and solid budget and budget justification. You must register for this webinar, but there is no cost associated. So please visit our website, and you can easily register there. And there will also be some information coming out if you are on our distribution. Just a couple of quick, I'm not going to go through the whole gamut, but the Mentor Connect project has unveiled a new resource library collection that specifically provides solutions to those of you who are in the grant proposal writing process and have needs in terms of the ATE program. So please visit our website. Um, it's listed here in a quick link at www.mentorconnect.org. And once you're on the website, if you click on the Visit Our Library, you will have access to various resources such as samples, templates, and much more. Um, of course, these are not the only resources. The ATE community has a plethora of resources available. So please tap into 
um, some of the other collaborators that you will find on our website also. One notable addition is the teachingtechnicians.org website. And um, one tool that's very helpful for me as being fairly new to the AT community is under that resources page, there is a guide for help for new AT APIs. So please, please don't hesitate to visit these sites and get more information. Please connect with Mentor Connect. Uh, we're here for you. We have a number of ways by which you can keep in touch with us. Send us an email, visit us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and check out our YouTube channel where this webinar will be housed um, in a few days. We welcome any questions or follow-up that you might have. Most importantly, visit our website. Call or email us in our just-in-time and on-demand help desk for answers to your inquiries. I'm typically the person that's going to field your request. And of course, if I'm not able to answer your question, we do defer um, internally and then from there to program officers and other colleagues in the community. So should you have colleagues who have missed this production today, please note that you as registrants will have full access to the slides and the full presentation via all of these modes of communication. And with that, on behalf of the Mentor Connect project team, we would like to thank you for your participation and attention for this webinar. We hope that you will connect with us, and we look forward to serving you. We would also like to take a moment to thank Maytech Networks for hosting today. They're always so pleasant to work with and absolutely appreciate it. So we've reached the conclusion of our webinar for today. I know we'll, if you have to leave and sign off, that's fine, but we will field some additional questions at this time per mic. Well, thank you, Charlotte, and also thank you for that nice